It seems like every action camera has pros and cons. But now a lot of the cons are gone, so I wanted to share why I think the GoPro Hero 10 is, in fact, a perfect 10. And while I am super excited to talk about this awesome little camera right here, I do want to let you know right off the bat that GoPro did send this to me for free because I'm awesome. <laughs> GoPro sent this to me for free, which is great, but there's no obligation on my part to make a video about it, to say anything about it. They don't get to look at any video I'm making about it. I was very interested in the Hero 10, but honestly, I was really happy with the GoPro that I'd already been using for the past three years, which was the Hero 7. But the reason I'm making this video, which again, I don't have to make a video, I'm choosing <laughs> under no duress to make a video about this, is because this is uh, pretty much the perfect GoPro. It's what I wish GoPros could have been from the very beginning when it literally was not technically possible for that to even have been the case. So aside from the Hero 10, which was sent to me and that's awesome, everything else you're gonna see in this video, all the other GoPros and accessories were all paid for by me. And so throughout this video, we're gonna look at image quality, we're gonna look at some of the specifications, and more than that, I wanna try to contextualize where this camera fits in my world as someone who's been using GoPros for 10 years but hasn't gotten a new one in several years. Now when it comes to the Hero 7, aside from a great form factor and good image quality, is 7 got a really cool feature which is hyper smooth stabilization. I believe this was pretty much the first GoPro that had really, really, really good stabilization. OG, it's the Hero 3 with 2.7K resolution. This is the Hero 5 with a helicopter in the background. This is the Hero 5. This is the Hero 7 with hyper smooth. Field of view is probably different though. This is hyper smooth stabilization on the 10. 10. That was kind of its selling point and that's definitely the thing that sold me on it. And that made it really powerful. So I've been using it for a lot of recording over the years and I've also been using it for a lot of streams. Anytime you've seen an overview shot of my entire studio in a live stream or a podcast, that's the Hero 7. So to better understand not only why I like the Hero 7, but why I like the Hero 10 so much better, we need to go back in time all the way 10 years to my very first GoPro, the Hero HD. You probably recognize this. It comes in that old like blast proof crazy case that looks like a scuba diver's helmet up on the top here. And if I pop open the camera itself, it's got like a rubbery coating on it. So it's, it's all very sticky and gross to touch because sometimes those matte rubber coatings break down over time. Fun fact though, if your rubber coating does start doing that on any electronic, you can use isopropyl alcohol and a little bit of elbow grease to just basically wipe it off and go to the clear plastic underneath. For example, the Zoom H4n that I'm recording backup audio into right now originally came with the same thing and it got so gross over the years that I just had to spend an evening basically wiping it all down and now this is perfect. The original GoPro Hero, this is sort of where I came into what the heck is a GoPro. Somebody sold me the idea of a GoPro as it's this super like durable camera that can stand up to pretty much anything. It's virtually indestructible because of the case that it comes with, it's waterproof, and it's got a super wide like fisheye field of view, which basically means that you just mount it somewhere and you don't have to think about framing your shot or missing anything. The original GoPros, as you might remember, they don't have a screen or anything just on the back. It just tells you the different resolutions. And the camera itself, as I'm sure you can kind of see here, is really relatively flimsy. It's just cheap plastic. It's not super durable. What made it durable was this case. This thing is like, even though it's 10 years old, you cannot break this case at all. I would make the case that you cannot break this case. That would be a breakthrough case of breaking the case. Mine, unfortunately, is broken. And it just like literally stopped and shut down like the battery had died, but then it never turned on again. So. Uh, that was the end of this one. At the time, it was really cool. In 2011, I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, looks great on my iPhone 4. But in today's world, it's not like amazing footage. And so after this one died, I upgraded to the Hero 3 Plus. If you want to compare it to the 10, it's quite different in size. It feels a little more durable than the original one, but it's still pretty plasticky. And very similar, it has no screen on the back 
but it does have a better lens. This one could shoot up to 2.7K and had a lot more features like that. This is also when the app came out, so that way you could now control it with your phone a little more easily. And then once it was in its case, it was a little more streamlined than the first one that I had. I'll put this on crooked. Oh God, it broke. Oh no, it just straight up, like it didn't come unclipped. It literally like broke. But this one was quite a good upgrade from the original and I really liked it, but it still wasn't perfect because the biggest downside to this is again, you could get all that, you could buy a little screen that went on it, you could adapt it, you could do all that, but everything felt kind of clunky. And using the app was okay, but I absolutely am not a huge fan of apps because they are kind of clunky and I hate when I have a physical thing, but the only way I can interact with it is through an app. So the first GoPro for me was 2011, the GoPro Hero 3 Plus was 2014, and then in 2017, that is when I got what I thought was the perfect GoPro, the GoPro Hero 5 Black. The 5 is still very much alive, it still works. I use this a lot on streams and consultation calls when I need to just mount a camera somewhere else, like if I need something over my Rodecaster Pro or I just want a different angle or something, I still use this one quite a bit. The form factor changed, it lost that super sleek like spy camera feel that the 3 and the 4 had, but it gained a lot because I didn't need a case that would eventually break into pieces. Instead, the camera itself was the case. It's waterproof without anything else. That was a big deal. I think we're taking that for granted nowadays. And then you could put on the skeleton housing if you wanted the extra mounts and stuff. Plus the biggest feature of all, this was the one that had a built-in touch screen. So now without needing any other attachments, I now had a touch screen which I could see what I'm recording and then I could also go in and start playing around with the menus and that changed everything because now I wasn't scared to dive into the full features and the full capabilities of the GoPro because it was so easy. And then I could use the app as a supplement. And that's when I really love apps is when they're supplements and they let you do cool things if you want to, but they're not required. And honestly, I'll share something with you that I feel is kind of silly and, and goofy, but it's true and it still is why this camera holds a very special place in my heart. When I got the Hero 5, on the back of it, it had a little plastic piece to like simulate the display that had a lady and a golden retriever and a kayak on it. And it really reminded me of our golden retriever, Ben, who I love very much and he's a very good boy. And I really wanted to use this camera to do fun stuff with like our dogs and everything. And for some reason that just like, it just hit me, it just hit me different and it made me really wanna have fun using all these tools with the people and the animals that I care about. And I know that that is silly and weird. And by the way, these are just GoPro cases from Amazon. They sell like GoPro basic cases if you want them, but you don't need them with the Hero 10 because it comes in its own little case. We'll get to that later just in case you were wondering. So that made the Hero 5 a very special camera to me. And I had really no interest in upgrading this except that when the Hero 7 came out, the Hero 7 is basically the exact same form factor as the Hero 5. It's just a little different. It's more black. It's like this is gray and kind of black and this is like really black. It's like how much more black could it be? And the answer is none. None more black. And so I did a video comparison when I got the Hero 7 between the 7 and the 5. And I'd recommend checking that video out because that's the video that sold me on this. My own video sold me on the Hero 7. I didn't, I never had or used a Hero 6, which had the same form factor. I don't have a Hero 8 or 9, but to sum those things up really quickly, the Hero 8 was basically the one where the Hero 5 tried to combine the camera and the plastic housing all into one smaller compact unit. The Hero 8 tried to do the same thing because in this case you still need to, if you want to mount the camera, you still need to put it in its housing and hopefully not break it. And then now you've got a slightly bulkier camera. That's not really a problem to me. It's more the like, do I put it in the housing or do I not put it in the housing? Do I take the housing with me? Do I not take the housing with me? Like that's kind of the annoying thing. And then if you want to change the battery or take out the memory card, then you take it out of the housing again very first world camera problems, but just enough friction to be kind of annoying. And so the GoPro Hero 8 came out and was like, hey, not only is the camera waterproof, but the mounts are built into it. So in a very similar way, the GoPro Hero 10 has the mounts just built in 
to the bottom of the camera right there and that's all you need to mount it and when you're done they go away. And the Hero 9 took things another step further by adding not just an informational LCD on the front but a front facing LCD and I think it might be slightly smaller than the one on the 10 but it's basically the same thing and that way you could see yourself there. I think that was in response to what some other companies like DJI and maybe Insta were doing with their action cameras where they didn't just have screens on the back, but now you could see yourself on the front. And then from the Hero 9, the Hero 10 takes things even further by bringing in a lot more frame rates, a lot more options, and as I mentioned, super good hyper smooth stabilization that is kind of completely unreal and absolutely a selling point on this camera. I should also mention that whatever processor is in here is significantly better because while the 5 and the 7 do have touch screens that work okay, they're a little bit laggy, whereas the Hero 10 is very, very responsive and really kind of works much more like a smartphone, like you would expect a smartphone to work. So like I said, you might notice a running theme. The original GoPro I was introduced to as, hey, this is an action camera that you can just mount on anything and it's virtually indestructible and it can go underwater. Crazy, right? Because maybe you might not remember how hard it was to film anything underwater prior to that it was like a whole ordeal when the hero 5 came out and it had the built-in screen and it was waterproof without a separate waterproof housing that felt like oh man this is what the gopro should have been like from the beginning and then the hero 7 came out with that same form factor except it had better image quality and really 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 good stabilization then it felt like man that's what the gopro should have been like from the beginning and then the 8 and the 9 iterated on that. But then the 10 came out and it has all of those features plus the front facing screen plus really, really good stabilization. You've probably seen this in some other videos about the GoPro, but really what it means is when you have hyper smooth turned on to the max, you can turn the camera to like a 45 degree angle before it actually starts shifting the angle. You can kind of see like I turn it and nothing happens and then there's a jump. And that's because this whole thing right here, as I'm recording this, actually I'll press record. So as I'm recording this right here, even though I'm turning the camera like this, the image itself is going to look pretty much entirely steady until I turn it far enough that it switches. That makes this incredibly usable. And of course you can turn that off because sometimes you do want that not super steady motion or you want some camera shake. So you can disable it and everything's back to like normal shake and bake like before, but there are a lot of quality of life upgrades in this camera that I've noticed, especially coming from one that was just a couple years older. What the heck? It's this one. For example, when you do time lapses, you still have the option to manually control everything. But if you want to do something like a time warp time lapse, it can adjust the speed automatically. So if I'm on a bike ride or something and I push this to do time warp, I don't have to think of like, well, I should do five second intervals and that means I need to record for 18 minutes or whatever. I can just press record for as long as I want. When it's done, it just sort of makes it look good through magic somehow. So it can do 5.3K at 30 frames per second. And I believe they said they're gonna do an update, a firmware update. Maybe by the time you're watching this video, it's already done, where you can do 5.3K at 24 FPS. Otherwise, you can do 24 FPS at 4K, of course. And then you can go all the way up to 4K 120. If you wanna do 240 frames a second, you can get that all the way up to 2.7K. And let me tell you, 240 frames per second is really, really fun. And even though it is 2.7K, depending on what you're filming and what your lighting conditions are, you might notice different levels of image quality there, but it's really fun. Just be aware that if you're filming at 240 FPS, you need a lot of light. It's not gonna work like indoors at night or anything like that. You're gonna get just a grainy mess. But if you're outside on a bright sunny day or you have a ton of studio lights to do something, you can do a lot of really cool stuff with some really high quality, high frame rates. And what I like about this interface is it almost reminds me of the Blackmagic cinema cameras where it's just really easy to understand. So instead of trying to go through each resolution and then seeing what I want, if you tap on the resolution, the available frame rates will light up and the unavailable ones will be grayed out. If you tap on a frame rate that you want, then the available resolutions will light up and the unavailable ones will be grayed out. And that is great. 
But what's also great with this is it has built in like really common settings. So as you go in, you have three profiles that are right there. There's like standard activity and then cinematic. Cinematic is really cool because that basically puts it in linear mode, which gets rid of that GoPro super view, super wide look and makes it look much more like a regular camera. So if you're going to try to match GoPro footage with footage from like a mirrorless camera or another regular camera, then you want it to be in linear mode. Past GoPros, like a lot of past GoPros, at least back until the five have that, but you have to go in and change it each time. I love that this not only comes with it out of the box, but has the ability to just keep it in a really easy to access place. And then if you wanna add your own custom settings, you can just press the plus button and then you can just create your own video profile. Like many GoPros, it has the feature where when the camera's off, you can press the record button and it will turn on and start recording as quick as possible to try to capture the moment. So if I have the camera totally powered off and I press record, 3.04 seconds for it to actually start recording. I think the hardest upgrade decision in this case is, is if you're gonna be somebody who uses a GoPro Hero 9, and you're like, eh, is the 10 worth it? And to be honest, I can't tell you because I've never used the 9. If you're coming from something before that, something like the 7, which is still by all means an excellent camera, but you still have the regular LCD on the front, you don't have built-in mounts that come with the camera, and you don't have, you know, super good hyper smooth, that's where I think the 10 is gonna be a massive upgrade. But speaking of massive, you will notice it is significantly larger than something like the five or the seven. But if you take these and you put them in their housing, then they're roughly the same size. I have this upside down just because it can't stand up there. But if I, but if I kind of hold them like this, then you're gonna see that they're basically the same. So the Hero 10, is like that housing really is just built into the camera. And what I can't show you on camera because it's impossible to communicate is how good this feels. This is a really nice like chunky, <laughs> maybe it's not the word that GoPro's marketing department would like to use, but it's a really good solid feeling camera. Sometimes everything doesn't need to be as small, thin and delicate as possible. In case you're wondering what I always do with my GoPros is I did buy a glass screen protector for the back and the front since the front is now an important screen. They came with ones for the lens, but I didn't put them on the lens since it is possible to just twist off the lens. All the way from the Hero 5 and up, you can just replace the lens. You still don't wanna damage your lens or anything like that, but it's still possible to replace it. And the Hero 10 also has a fancy coating on the lens that I can't remember what it's called, but it's supposed to repel water a bit more. So in the past, if you took GoPros if they're underwater, they look good, but if you're just out in the rain or you go from underwater to above water, sometimes droplets and things would stick on the lens and you'd get this amazing shot, but there'd be like a water droplet in the middle that just ruined it. Now I've been praising the Hero 10 here a lot, but I just, I really like it. But while we're here, I'd like you to hear oh, about all of the things that I don't particularly like about the Hero 10. And there aren't really, there's like one and a half asterisk so the asterisk in that case would be overheating. And if you've been watching videos about the Hero 10, you probably have seen people talking about overheating and it is a thing that can happen with this camera. Personally, whenever I'm recording with the GoPro, it's extremely short bursts of recording. It's a few seconds at a time. You know, it's maybe a couple minutes if I have it like on a bike or something, maybe, I'll ha maybe I will have it going for 15 or 20 minutes. I haven't had any issues with overheating on any of these cameras. However, there have been lots of reports and lots of evidence, like actual proof, where the Hero 10 can overheat in some of the higher frame rates, resolutions, and that kind of stuff if it's running for a while. Also, I'm not gonna dive into it because David Manning did a really, really good video all about overheating on the GoPro over on his channel. So instead of just copying all of his tests and what he did, I'll just recommend that you go check out his video about overheating. But to sum up his conclusions, if you're using the camera in a normal setting, it shouldn't really be an issue unless you're trying to do something like 4K 120 for an extended period of time of you know more than 15 or 20 minutes, which, if you're doing something that you need more than 15 minutes of 120 FPS footage or 240 FPS footage or whatever, that's a very specialized project that probably requires something more than a GoPro anyway. For the vast majority of people who are spending a few hundred dollars on an action camera, I think it's very reasonable that it can't record indefinitely at an insanely high frame rate. It would be cool if it could, but if it can't, 
I shan't complain. Now I tried to explain my opinion in the comment section of David's video, and as you can imagine, I was met with a lot of really intelligent, polite discourse. So while overheating doesn't affect me, I don't have any issues with it, I've not experienced any issues with it, and when the camera is just being used as a video source for like a live stream or something, even after hours of being turned on, I've not had it overheat. So I think that only applies to when it's recording. But if you're thinking about getting the GoPro Hero 10, it's probably important for you to just kind of check out some of the overheating stuff to see if it's going to work with your workflow or not. Now the other like couple things that I'm not a huge fan of with the camera but really aren't a big deal are the battery life. Considering everything the camera's doing, it's recording at super high resolutions, it's really small, it's powering two displays, not getting eight hours of battery life from one battery pack is fine as was the case with any other GoPro that came before this, just get some extra batteries and then you'll be fine. So while I have found that it does seem to drain a little bit faster than the previous cameras, I don't really consider that a problem because the benefits that the Hero 10 brings over the other cameras to me are worth it. Now the last complaint that I have, in the same way that overheating doesn't matter to me because it, with my workflow it's not an issue, but it could be a big deal to some other people, this is something that does matter to me, but other people are like, ah, who cares? And that is the lack of ports, really. Especially, most importantly, there's no HDMI output on the GoPro Hero 10. But on all of my other working GoPros that I use regularly, they have not only USB power, but they also have a micro HDMI output. And in general, micro HDMI is terrible, but on a teeny tiny action camera, it makes sense. You can't have mini or full size HDMI in here. And that's great because I can just run these cameras directly into my ATEM Mini and then they can be an HDMI source for streams and stuff like that, and I do that all the time. That's how I've been using these three cameras specifically as part of podcasts and live streams for like a couple of years now, and it's been awesome. And I got the Hero 10, and I was super excited to do that, and then I went to go plug it in, and I was like, wait, there's no ports over here. There is the battery and the memory card and a USB-C port. On the other side, it looks like there's something, but there's nothing you can actually open up. There's no other... No other doors besides this one on the GoPro. And so this is for the media mod, which kind of looks like one of the old traditional housings, except it connects to that. And then on the back, it gives you extra ports. So you get like a microphone output, HDMI. I think you get something else. It seems cool, but it, I, I don't need any of that. I just want HDMI out. And I don't want to have to buy that whole thing just to get an HDMI output, especially because from what I have seen in a lot of the videos I've been watching, and I've watched a lot of them, the Media Mod microphone is not as good as the built-in microphone on the Hero 10. So this is my Sony a7S III with my Sony 24mm f1.4 lens running through a lavalier microphone that's mounted directly onto me. And this is the GoPro Hero 10 just sitting on the slider next to my camera in the exact same settings. But now this is the microphone that's from the GoPro Hero 10. And it is beyond arm's reach away. So it's probably three and a half, maybe even almost four feet away from me at this point. If I pick up the camera and I bring it closer to me because I was talking to it like this, then you can kind of hear how the sound changes. And if I were to turn the camera around because I wanted to show you something, like look, there's the camera that I have set up. So you could see the stuff here. Look at me talking. That's not the same quality of audio you're getting from the rest of a whole video production experience. But I think it's pretty darn good. I think it's pretty usable. It also works well when it's windy outside. It blocks out wind pretty well without needing to attach anything else to it. The reason I'm not listing that as like a true negative is because I kind of do understand that maybe the number of people who were actually connecting their GoPro to an HDMI output was really, really small. And fortunately, they didn't totally leave me out to dry because I can use the USB port and connect this to my computer and then I can download the GoPro webcam app, which is free and it's pretty good, but it's it's pretty limited, but it's functional. And then when you turn the camera on, the screen is just gonna say USB connected. And up in your menu bar of your computer, there's gonna be a little GoPro icon. The blue dot means that something is connected. And if you click on that, then you're gonna get some options here. And if you click on show preview, it will give you a little window where you can see it right there and you can mirror it even. You have some other basic options, like you can change the lens from wide, narrow to linear. And there's a few very basic preferences about resolution and stuff like that. But the reason that that is super cool is for somebody like me who uses Ecamm Live or 
I guess whatever streaming software you're using, the GoPro, once it's connected to the webcam app, will just become a video source in Ecamm Live. And so the benefit now is that even though this is not running through the ATEM Mini, it's actually a second video source. So now I have the ATEM with all of its connections as a video source, and then I also have the GoPro as a separate video source. So the reason that that's a big deal, and actually really cool for my workflow, is I can still have these running through the ATEM, but I can have this as a separate source, and then I can build scenes and stuff around that. So I can do picture in picture, I can do like all kinds of really cool creative stuff that I can't do if everything is just running through one source, because the ATEM Mini with all of its eight sources is just one input. It's almost like having another little capture card that's GoPro specific in the camera, which is, which is pretty fun. The weird thing about this though, is that while it's connected via webcam, the battery still goes down. Like the battery still drains just more slowly. The other day I did a live stream that went for two hours exactly. And at the start of it, the camera had 100% battery life. I had it mounted on my boom arm and it was like, it was really cool and goofy. And at the end of it, it had 20% battery life. So it lost 80% in two hours using the power of math. You could probably figure out that rate of like, boo -doo -boo -doo. but it just means that you're not gonna be able to use it all day in webcam mode. But it did last the two hours just fine. It didn't overheat or have any problems like that. But something like the Hero 7, where I have a video output through HDMI, and then I also have a USB plug to keep it charged, this thing can be on indefinitely. So I do wish that worked a little bit different. It's not too big of a deal, but those are the only negatives that I've found while using the camera. But this really is everything I wanted a GoPro to be from the beginning. Every single pain point, every single frustration I had with the original GoPro is completely remedied and improved upon in here, including more stuff that wasn't even possible at the time, like 240 FPS, insane stabilization. The fact that this is a fun camera means that I want to use it more, which means I make more fun stuff with it. And I just, I have more fun because of this camera. So now I would like to go ahead and professionally thank all of the people who help support my channel so that I can make all these ridiculous videos that I have a lot of fun doing. I really appreciate your support. And if you want to check out a couple of my other camera related reviews and videos, I've got a few of them for you right here. So check them out and I will see you over in one of those videos.